part of this workshop, I think we're going to need about two hours to, to go through this, is going to be about uh, machine learning for sensor data. Um, as I said, what I'm going to mention here is the fundamentals for some of these different algorithms, and I have a couple of favorites in there. I can tell you why I like them, and I can tell you which ones are going to work better if you know what you're doing, right? Uh, so it's going to be about the concepts of machine learning or statistical learning, <coughs> and I can provide some examples throughout the, uh, the, the talk. Um, so most of us know about physics-based models, right? This is where you go and sit down and write differential equations that relates the output of a system or a desired parameter to some variations at the input. And nowadays, because we have cheap computation and lots of memory and almost uh, connectivity everywhere, we are collecting a lot of data to the extent that it's beyond the capabilities of our physical models. So you're seeing more and more the uh, deployment, application development of these data-driven models. Differences, well, in a physics-based model, you have a system-level approach, right? You look at the components in your system, you look at the outputs, you look at the inputs, and you try to come up with relationships between these different uh, components. It is deterministic, right? So if you say V is equal to IR, V is equal to IR. One milliamp, one kilo ohm gives you one volt, right? There's no um, uncertainty there. Uh, if you want to develop proper models, you need to know the physics of your system well. You need to know about the interferences, right? If you're making a MEMS device, almost inevitably you're going, you're going to have interference between the pads. You know, the signal that you measure on one pad has some, uh, uh, some contribution from signal on the neighbor pad. In many cases, you have to know about nonlinearities. In most cases, you want to avoid them, but sometimes you want to incorporate them into your system model. And then, you know, as soon as you start to bring nonlinearities into your differential equations and system models, anybody who has tried that knows that things can get uh, tricky and challenging very, very quickly. The coupling between the systems is important, right? So if you have two resonators that are working side by side, there's a good chance that they will see each other, right? And then sometimes it is desired, sometimes undesired. And <clears throat> in the end of the story, you have to know your physics in order to develop these models. Data-driven models, on the other hand, are based on statistical inference, right? You look at the data, and hopefully you see a trend, and you throw an equation on it, and you <coughs> try to see how well that equation describes the data. Um, the way that you describe the data may not really be related to the physics of the problem, right? So you may uh, measure v, uh, the voltage across a resistor and the current through that resistor and try to come up with that V equal IR method. But if you have a little bit of self-hitting in that resistor, you actually may see some nonlinearities in there. And you will see that you know, a polynomial is going to describe that better or things like that. And you know, that could be V equal IR or F equal MA or anything else, right? So the structure is not, and in m many cases, you actually don't even have a function that describes the relationships. Now, this is one interesting thing about the statistical models that sometimes you do not model some complexity. You do not even know about it, or you don't have enough information about the physics that is on, going on, or you cannot figure out why this is happening to your system. And if you have enough data, a statistical model can take care of that, can actually incorporate that into the model, the, the, new, the statistical model that you are uh, building for that system. Now, you all have heard about data science and you know, big data and uh, deep learning and things like that. I'm going to focus on machine learning. The difference between the two is that deep learning or data science, it's where you have a lot of data. In most cases, there's no physics related to, to each other. Right? So you look at, for example, all the tweets on the Twitter or the relationships, connections on Facebook or um, image processing, applications like that, 
Uh, that's big data, that's deep learning and on things like that. Machine learning, what I'm going to talk about, or at least the focus here, is that you have a problem. You have a specific problem and you try to solve it and you try to maybe improve on the physical model that you have or, or the number of variables at the input are much more limited. The number of features is much more limited, right? So if you're, for example, trying to make a, uh, to develop an algorithm to detect spam in emails, you will have many, many, many features at the input. You have to look for so many variables at the input. But if it is only about improving the performance of an accelerometer or something like that, you usually have only few parameters to look for. So machine learning is a subset or, or a much uh, smaller, uh, has a much more focused uh, application area. What we do in machine learning is that you identify the problem, usually, especially for sensing cases, you know what you're looking for, you try to, uh, to come up with a framework for what you want to do, and then you instrument your data sources, right? So if I'm um, trying to, so this example, I may come back to it uh, again, but if I'm trying to figure out what is the height of this elevator with respect to the first floor, Okay, so what is the data source that they can actually have here? You can use an accelerometer and, you know, integrate that acceleration a couple of times to estimate the height. You can, there's a whole bunch of different ways to estimate the height of that elevator, right? So you want to figure out what the height of that elevator is, and then you go and figure out what are the sensors that are available to, data sources that are available to you, and you collect the data. And if it is a statistical model, it means that you may not have a proper physics-based model that relates the input to the output. You don't know what the relationship is. You need to come up with some weights to, to fix the model here, to train a model here. Most of the data that you collect may not be useful as they are. You have to transform them. You may have to get rid of the offset. You may have to get rid of, let's say, the high-frequency components that are out there. You may have to transform them from one uh, coordinate system to another. And then you build the model, and this is where you choose the algorithm that you want to apply, right? So if you want to use a linear regression model or a logistic regression, well, di different types of applications, but let's say a support vector machine or a neural network or anything else. How do I build that model? Or what algorithm do I choose? How do I build it? And then how do I make sure that this model works well? So what you do is that you go and look at the data that you have that hopefully you know what it means and what was the output, and try to improve the accuracy of the model using a cross-validation uh, uh, of your labeled data. And eventually, you communicate or use the results or use this to predict the uh, values for uh, new inputs. Now, what I tell my students is that this is like using a CAT tool. Right, so a numerical tool, a numerical simulator is as good as your understanding of the problem. Garbage in, garbage out, right? So for a numerical simulator, you have to know what is going to happen. If you don't know it, you know, if you take the response, the output of that simulator and trust, put all your trust in it, you can be misled very easily, right? So at the end of the story, you still need to know your physics, right? But maybe this can help you in some certain cases because of all the additional computation and, and storage capabilities that we have nowadays. Um, the lot of these statistical models, when we use them, they do not really take raw data. You take the data and you try to come up with something interesting, something that summarizes that data for you. So for example, if I have, uh, I have a dumb watch, but if you have a smart watch, um, and you want to detect activity, and you want to, for example, look at if this person is running or standing or, or, or uh, walking, you look at the signal from the accelerometer, and you can collect that data, let's say, at 25 hertz, 50 hertz, some, some sampling rate. That raw data comes in. You can fit it to some of these signal processing algorithms, like neural networks and uh, uh, reservoir computers and things like that. They just take raw data in but it's going to be very computationally expensive if you want to process that raw data. So usually what you do is that you go and let's say, okay, in that past one second, let's say, what was the number of peaks in acceleration? Maybe I can relate that to the number of steps this person took, right? Or in the past five seconds, or the past 10 seconds. 
And then what you produce from that raw data is a number that summarizes that. So let's say in the past five seconds, this person took three steps, or 10 steps, or no steps. And that could be one feature that you use in your algorithm to figure out what this person is doing, right? So it's, rare, it's very rare that we use raw data. You usually have to extract some features from them. Uh, as just mentioned, a feature is usually a number that summarizes the useful information in your raw data and just basically compresses all of that into one number or, or a set of numbers. A feature may be measurable or calculable, right? And let's say for some examples of features, if I want to predict or recognize faults in machinery, so let's say if there's a pump running here, and I want to figure out if it is doing okay or if it is nearing its service time or it's going to fail, I may attach an accelerometer to this thing and listen to the vibration patterns. And let's say I monitor the vibration the energy of the vibration signals, let's say, in a certain bandwidth. If it is within a range, I, it's probably doing OK. Or I may be monitoring the current that goes into the motor that is running that pump. And that I can use it as a different uh, feature. Um, if you are looking for, let's say, estimation of house prices in, in a region, there are a few parameters that you can look at as a feature. Right? So for example, the area of the house is one parameter. The zip code is another parameter. Um, age of the house, all sorts of things. You know, how many rooms are there? What are the, um, let's say, closeness to a school, to a good school? Things like that can affect the price of a house. So those are all features that you can actually use in order to improve your model that estimates the price of that house. Activity detection from a sensor data. So for example, if I go back to uh, the accelerometer example, I can look at the number of peaks per second or per 10 second, or I can look at the energy density in different portions of the spectrum for um, activity detection. Uh, detection of zip codes on uh, envelopes, this is actually a very well-known problem in, uh, if you look up any machine learning course or data science course, they usually go back to this, that you want to detect this handwritten or uh, classify these handwritten digits, right? So, and people write in so many different ways. How do you do that? So what are the typical features that you can use? If it is a number between zero and nine that you want to detect, you can look, for example, at the symmetry of the pixels in that, or the portion of the pixels that are black relative to portion that is white, or you know, vertical symmetric, uh, horizontal symmetry, all sorts of those features can be used in order to summarize the information in, a, in an image file for that digit and hopefully classify it correctly. Spam email classification, right? So for example, you look for keywords, right? If there's a word, I don't know, Viagra in it, there's a good chance that it is spam, right? Maybe it is not, but. Uh, so you look for words or, or words that are misspelled, right? Because these spam, uh, People that are sent spam are actually smart, so they misspell words on purpose. So some of the, the algorithms may not detect them, but you can use that as a feature, actually, in some of your email spam detection algorithms. So you have to actually, this is, and, and, and I, at least in the applications that I've dealt with, and I think it is true for most of sensing applications, coming up with proper features is more important than the algorithm that you use. At the end of this story, you can use, you know, k-nearest neighbors, neural networks, support vector machines, all sorts of those algorithms. They perform fairly closely to each other in most cases. But if you have a good feature that nobody else is looking at, it actually can make or break, or, or make a huge difference in your case. So feature engineering, coming up with the right set of features is very, very important in sensing applications. And part of that is because your features are limited, your data sources are limited, right? So your, the amount of the dimensions of the problem are relatively small. Um, so when we talk about features, feature extraction is converting the raw data into those numbers. Feature transformation is, in some cases, to make the life of uh, your algorithm easier, you want to, for example, change the coordinate system. Instead of doing the calculations in 
let's say, X, Y coordinates, maybe you want to do it in R theta coordinates from Cartesian to, to Polo, right? And it actually makes some problems separable that may not be separable uh, that easily at the beginning. So you, sometimes you have to do this feature transformation. Sometimes you have too many features. Hopefully we don't have that problem in sensing. You know, you usually actually would appreciate more features, but you can have unnecessary features, redundant features that you may not need. So, for example, if uh, I have the area of a house in square meters and square feet, it's the same thing. It's a redundant feature that I am actually adding to my algorithm in a, uh, it's not helping me. If I have the price of a food item and I'm looking at if it is a healthy food item or not, that may not really indicate anything, right? This could be irrelevant, unnecessary, or redundant features, and they can actually cause problems. So there are methods to get rid of them that I will very briefly talk about. So common features that we use, you know, usually if you're developing a, a machine learning algorithm, these are the features that you will have at the very beginning, and then you go and add to it or, or uh, come up with new features. The average of a signal is usually a good starting point. The median of a signal is another one. Power, RMS, uh, same thing, standard deviation is related to that. So these are features that you usually just calculate all the time. And usually you use that in your uh, algorithm unless you figure out that some of that is unnecessary. Right? But these are the starting features. And uh, when we build a feature vector, so you're basically, these are the inputs to your machine learning algorithm. By convention, the first element of your feature vector is set to one. And this is to account for offsets, for biases in your model, right? And we'll see that very soon, what that means. So you have, if you have a feature vector that let's say has all of these in it, the very first one is one, and then you look at the average and standard deviation and median and quartiles and things like that, right? When we talk about learning uh, from data, you usually hear about two different approaches here. There is supervised learning and unsupervised learning. In supervised learning, you know how the algorithm should behave. You know that if I give it this input, it should produce that output. And you collect some data based on that. Given the input vector x, you know the outputs. You have measured them. They are given to you. You try to come up with a function that relates those inputs to that output. And now the idea here is that the question here is that how can I find the best function that produces the minimum error, especially for new data, but also for this labeled data that I already have. So this is called supervised learning. I know the output. I know the input. Well, the input is usually given, but I know the output. And I want to put a function between to convert the input to the output. Um, and you just talked about that. So example problems, classification, right? So I can say that, okay, here, computer, if you see these 300 pictures of cats, and I'm showing you a new picture, I want, to tell, I want the computer to be able to tell me if it is a cat picture or not, right? Something like that. So classification is a very... <coughs> A well-known uh, case, you have discrete outputs. You can also have continuous outputs, right? So again, problem is that computer, here is the house prices in this region. Tell me the price for this house. What is the expected price for this house? So it's a continuous output. It's not discrete. Unsupervised learning, the issue is that you usually don't have an output. You just have some data. And what you want to do is that you're just trying to figure out if there is a pattern, if there is a, uh, something going on underneath this data that you have. You want to find out if you can come up with an expression here to simplify what, it, you may not always find that, you may, there may not always be something behind uh, all the patterns that you see in the data, but you want to see if you can come up with a, um, a way of summarizing your data, a way of simplifying your data set. You usually don't have a labeled data because you usually don't have output, right? So let's say the Twitter feed, if you are looking at the, all tweets done in a day, there's no target output. People are just you know, randomly tweeting. And uh, you just want to figure out if there is a pattern in that data. Uh, so 
What, when do we do that? We use that when we want to cluster data. We want to, let's say, group the data, right? So for example, if you're producing all sorts of news, Google is searching all news sites all day, they can group them. They can say these are related to sports, this is foreign affairs, this is economy. You want to group all of these different data uh, points into clusters. And in many cases, you want to reduce the dimensions, right? So again, if you go back to that news item, you have a thousand news sources, a million pieces of news, let's say, generated a day, but you can just reduce it to maybe 100 categories or so. Reduce the dimensions of your input data space. Techniques that people use or algorithms that people use or we use for supervised learning. Linear regression is a very common one. It's basically the fundamental one that hopefully everybody knows. I'll go through that very quickly. But it is the fundamental supervised, a fundamental supervised learning algorithm. And the reason I like it is that it's very easy to understand and you can just extrapolate very easily from that. Logistic regression um, is a classification algorithm. It produces a probability for something to belong to, to a certain class or not. And we can actually relate it somehow to linear regression. It's not the same thing, but you know, once we talk about linear regression, logistic regression will, will follow. And it is important because this is the foundation for neural networks that are the drivers of all these uh, machine learning or deep learning uh, processes nowadays. K and N, K nearest neighbors, this is one of my favorite algorithms. It's just super easy to understand. And it works fine in, in a lot of cases. Problem is that you need a lot of computing power, but you know we have that nowadays. Naive Bayes is a very simple algorithm. Again, we talk about that in a second, but uh, again, easy to understand. And you know, once you understand the algorithm, it's much, much easier to go and um, uh, troubleshoot if there is some. Decision trees, <coughs> again, are based on how humans think or very close to how humans think and try to divide and find patterns in data. So they're easy to understand. They don't perform very well, unfortunately, on, on most practical applications. Support vector machines are probably the dominant classification algorithms nowadays, if, um, especially in sensing cases. Very, very powerful. The problem with them is that you don't know how they're working. It's very hard to troubleshoot an SVM. You just have to try a whole bunch of different things until they work, uh, or you improve their performance. And the neural networks, in the end, are the buzzword of the day. Problems that you have with all of these guys is that how do you make sure that you know this algorithm is better than the other or working better than the other? Overfitting is always a problem. You know you usually have uh, models that are too complex for the problem you're trying to solve, and cross validation is an issue. How do you improve? How do you improve the model accuracy using the limited amount of data that you usually have? In unsupervised learning, you usually have these two uh, um, methods, k-means clustering and factor analysis. The most common one that everybody, almost everybody using is k-means algorithm, and we'll talk about that uh, at the end. And I'll tell you about an application case that we actually had to use unsupervised learning in order to uh, solve a problem. But in most cases, you're going to go and pick one of these algorithms in order to uh, improve the performance of your signal processing. Okay, what's the difference between classification and regression? Regression, in, in a regression problem, the output is continuous. You're producing a real number, right? So for example, the house price, or the estimated output for a sensor, or things like that. Um, so that is one example. In a classification problem, the output have, you have certain labels for the possible outputs, discrete outputs, right? So is this email spam or not, zero or one? Is this a picture of a cat or a dog or a leopard or a horse, right? So you can have multiple classes, but there are a finite number of classes that you can assign the input to. Uh, you have discrete values. Uh, this I just mentioned. Yeah, multi-class. So you, it can be a two-class situation, binary, zero, one, or multi-class, where you want to, for example, figure out if this number is anything between zero and nine. 
Uh, so you have a multi-class and in, in many cases they actually go and fall back onto binary. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, so in all of these cases, I'm going to have some definitions here. As I said, these are available on the slides that you can download from that Dropbox folder that I shared. Um, the number of samples. This is my training sample, right? These are the data that this is the data that I've already collected and labeled. Is M lowercase M sample I looks like this. So I have an input. And remember, this is a feature vector, right? This is not raw data. So I have a feature vector i that corresponds to this, I don't know, this house with these many uh, rooms and all these other parameters. So this is xi. And yi is the output, the price for that house. Right? So xi is all of the features at the input. And yi is a number or a label uh, for the output. My feature vector is an n plus 1 by 1 vector x naught is always one because i want to account for biases and you know the the non-zero contributions uh, and uh, the rest of it is the features that i either measure or calculate from the raw data so that's my feature vector xi all of my input data set can be put inside the matrix so if I look at that feature vector that's a uh, vertical vector. I can take the transpose, and the first row in this matrix is my first sample, second row is second sample, all the way to the nth sample. So this matrix, which includes all of my input data, is an m by n plus 1 matrix. So that's all of my input data that is labeled. Uh, yi is the true output. As I said, it could be a label or a number. And all of my outputs, the labels, can be put inside a vector like that. So I have the input data that is in this matrix. I have the output data that is that in this vector. And I want to find a function that takes this and produces this with minimum error, or something very close to this. right? So that's the entire goal for machine learning. How do I do that? I assume that there are some weights here. And then by n plus 1 by 1 weight vector, w0 to wn, that I will use to give different features different weights. And I will choose a function that will take this weighted combination of features to produce the output. This function is the algorithm that I choose for my training, right? neural network support vector machine, kn, and whatever. Right? And these weights is where the adaptation come from. So x was fixed, y was fixed. This w is what is changing. Once I pick the function, the algorithm that I choose, I have to go and find a way to pick the best values for these w's in order to relate the x's to the y's. f can be linear, nonlinear, or actually not even a function that you can specify. Now, the question is that how do I know if this is working well? How do I know if my uh, assumed function is doing a good job on predicting the uh, outputs based on the input? I need to come up with a cost function. I need to come up with a way to quantify the performance of this algorithm, right? So I need to go and say, for these values of weights, for this weight vector w, I somehow look at the difference between the true value and the predicted value, and look at the entire data set that I have, right, from 1 to m, and I try to minimize this cost function. So this f is going to be my algorithm. This is my cost function. Minimization of the cost function is the learning part. I try to find out the best weights here to minimize this cost function. And this is true for all of these learning algorithm. So whichever supervised learning algorithm that you pick, this is the process. You pick the algorithm, you define a proper cost function for that algorithm, and you minimize that cost function. OK? Now, OK, so let's just go through training data and test data. I'll talk about that very soon. Uh, 
Okay, so training. We have some labeled data. We have data that was fed into the system and the output was monitored. So we had, let's say, features for houses in some region and we have prices for those houses. We had um, some files that uh, for, let's say, features extracted from acceleration data and we had corresponding activities that with this kind of a data or at this point of time the person was running and this is the feature set and then at this point of time the person was walking and these are the features and these are the outputs right uh, so these are labeled data points and what you want to do is that we want to go and play with those weights come up with the best values for these weights to minimize the error of our algorithm now we are going to talk about overfitting soon, but you know that if I give you a bunch of points in space, you can find an algorithm, you can find a function that goes through all of them perfectly. You get zero error. That's usually not the objective. We don't want to do that. That's called an overfit uh, problem. What we want to do is that we want to make sure that this algorithm that we are developing for this usually finite set of labeled data, which is expensive, right? Because somebody has to label that data. Somebody has to actually for example, if it is an image database, somebody has to check if it is a cat picture or a dog picture or something else, right? That takes time, that time is money. Uh, so if you want to make sure that the algorithm is working well, we want to fit it to that data, but we need to test it. And for testing it, how do you evaluate the performance? You need labeled data again. Right? Otherwise, how do you know if it is doing well or not? Um, so we need more data for training, uh, for testing, we call that the test set. The, que the problem is that we don't have that much data. So in most cases, what you do is that whatever labeled data you have, you divide it into two sets. You take 60%, 70% of it for training, and the rest of it for testing. So you train your algorithm based on a portion of this data set, and then you evaluate in per its performance with the remaining data that your algorithm hasn't seen so far. So we call that a training set and a validation set, or a training set and a test set. And uh, the validation subset, as I mentioned, is used to assess the performance of the algorithm that you developed already. Typical ratios are somewhere between 60-40 to 80-20, depending on how much data you have. Right? So if you don't have too much data, usually you want to go closer to 60-40. If you have an enough number of the labeled data points, you make it 80-20. Right? So you develop a good algorithm and then test it on still a good number of data points at that 20%. So training versus test error. If you look at the cost function that we had before, and if this is the number of training, uh, if uh, this is the number of the labeled data sets, what happens is that your training error goes up as you add more, and as you try to fit your algorithm, your function, your uh, model to those data points, and that's expected, right? So if I tell you that fit a polynomial to, let's say, second order polynomial to a single point, you can do that with zero error, right? So that, that will be here. If I tell you fit it to two points, you'll get still a very small error, maybe zero error, right? So if it is a second order polynomial, you get zero error. If I give you three points, you get zero error. If I get four, if I give you four points, you start to get some error, right? So as you increase the number of samples for your function, your training error goes up, but hopefully it will plateau at some point. Right? So that's your training error. Your test error, however, when you test your algorithm with data that it hasn't seen, will follow a pattern like that. Initially, if you fit your polynomial to one data point, it will produce a lot of error for all the other data points. But as you add more and more samples to your, um, you adapt your weights with more and more samples, the error that you have on new data starts to decrease, right? And hopefully they will approach to each other after a certain amount of time. So you need, in most cases in machine learning and statistical learning, nobody complains about more data. The more data you provide, 
As long as you know how to handle the model complexity, we're going to talk about that in a second, you can improve the accuracy of your model. However, there is a situation where too much data, if you just use it blindly, may not help you. And this is called bias versus variance in machine learning and statistical learning literature. Um, in engineering, we call it underfitting, overfitting. Right? So that's a more common term for us. But if your model is not complex enough, you will have a bias problem. It is underfitting it. Right? So if you have, uh, let's say, three data points that are not fitting on a line and you try to fit a line to it, you get some error. Right? Or if you have data points that are from, let's say, a polynomial, but you're trying to fit a straight line to it, you, you'll get a good amount of error. Your model is not complex enough. You do not have enough variables to play with in order the model, for the model to fit the data. You can have the opposite problem as well. And this actually is, is, is more common than this one because you can always add features. You can always add new weight, weights, new features, things like that. This is relatively easy to fix. Overfitting is where you, your model is just too complex. And what happens, the danger here is that the model is so complex that it fits your training data almost perfectly, but behaves very poorly on new data. And that's the danger. You know, this actually happens more often than the bias issue. So here is <clears throat> the situation. Model complexity, think about it as, let's say, the order of polynomial that you're using to fit to a data. Right? So you have some data points in space, the order of the polynomial that you're using in order to fit to that, and J is your cost function. Training error goes down as you increase that polynomial order. Right? So if you have 10 data points in space, with a nine order polynomial, I can fit that perfectly, and anything higher. 9 order polynomial, 10 order polynomial, 11th order polynomial. I can fit to that data perfectly. So the training error goes down as you increase the model complexity. However, your test error initially goes down. Right? Initially, you're basically your function is trying to uh, predict the behavior of your, um, let's say, function, the underlying phenomena well. But at some point, it starts to go off very quickly. Your model is performing very well on your training set, but very poorly on the new data. And this is an overfitting problem, right? So we don't want, and this is really not that easy to fix, and it can basically be like those super nice looking graphs that, or videos that you get from numerical simulations that are entirely wrong, right? So you have to be careful. So this is where we have to make sure that the model complexity is suitable for the problem that you're dealing with. So ideally, I want to choose the model complexity somewhere near the bottom of this cap. The problem is that I don't, in most cases, know where that optimum point is. So I have to try a few different things. Now, one of the ways to avoid this high variance is regularization. As I said, overfitting is a problem that scares most people than, than bias. And uh, in regularization, what you do is that you come up with a complex model, but you say, okay, I don't want to overfit to this data, so what I do is that I give a penalty to each one of those weights. If a weight starts to become too large, it may be an indication that I'm overfitting to the data in my training set, so I give it a penalty, right? So from linear regression, you go to reach regression. But basically, it's trying to keep a balance between all the weights in your models, and hopefully, as long as you normalize your features, this should work. If you're overfitting to your data, first solution that most people go after is that they go and try to collect more data. But that may not be always possible, right? So sometimes you have to wait a long time. Sometimes you have to spend a lot of time trying to figure out what it is uh, and label it. This is good, and it usually, if you can do it, do it. But it, it usually is an expensive solution. Um, you can go and reduce the number of features in your model. You know, if you think you're overfitting to your data, you go and reduce the number of features in your model. But how do you do that? How do you decide which feature to drop or not, or which uh, 
parameter is not affecting the output. There are formal ways of doing it. So there is a method that is called principal component analysis. Let me see if I mention it here. Uh, yeah. So this is principal component analysis. And what it does is that the, this, this, this method, this algorithm, goes and looks at the variance at the output of your model that can be attributed to this feature or that feature or that feature. And then what you can do is that you can go and say, OK, I want to keep 90% of the variance, the variation, information. Variance is information, right? 90% of the information at the output. And you look at the first 10 features of the 500 that you may have, and that 10 describe all of that information, or 90% of that information. So you get rid of all the stuff that you don't need. This can be done <coughs> fairly actually easily. It's basically a covariance matrix calculation, and you rank all those features. You calculate the eigenvalues of that covariance matrix, and that's it. Uh, manually selecting features to keep, that's usually doable for sensing applications because you don't have too many features, right? So you're dealing with 5, 10, something like that, right? But in some of the other cases, it may be just too many to do it manually. And regularization is what we just mentioned here, right? You keep all the features, but you try to create some balance between them. You try to make sure that some of them will not dominate uh, the entire uh, process. OK. So let's start with linear regression. So all the discussion that we had so far were just definitions and playing field. Let's start with the basic algorithm here, linear regression. I know most of uh, people here have been using it for a long while. Just quickly overview what we want to do. So you have an output that, let's say, is a function of one input, and you want to come up with a relationship between the input and output. So you want to take the input, multiply it by some weight, add some bias to it to get the output. The goal is to find optimum values for W0 and W1. So this is in case that you have a one input. If you have more than one input, you will talk about planes and hyperplanes in higher dimensional uh, uh, spaces. In all cases, you produce a number as a weighted combination of features. Um, so this is the input. W naught, X naught, remember the first element in that feature vector was one plus a weighted sum of all the other features gives you the output. Uh, if I want to write it in vector format, this is my feature vector, this is my, sorry, this is my weight vector, and this is the input data. I can simply write it that way. And I call it linear regression because it is linear in weights, right? So I can have the second feature in my feature vector can be x1 squared. And the third feature can be sine of x1. And the fourth feature can be log of x1. All of those are OK. As long as this stays linear in Ws, I call it a linear regression model, right? So it is called linear regression because it's a linear function of weights. And the cost function I define is basically sum of the squared errors. So I look at the uh, estimated output, take a difference between that and the true output, square that and add it up over the entire data set. And this is my cost function, and I want to minimize that. So this is the longer form writing. And to minimize the cost function, I take the derivatives with respect to those weights. Right? So I take the derivative of the cost function with respect to W0, then W1, then all the way to Wn, and set it to 0. If I solve that system of equations, that should give me the optimum weights. So I set that left side of the equation to 0. And remember, these are matrices. You know, These are the dimensions for those matrices. And you just go through the math. And it's very straightforward. You can actually find weights in one line of code, all the optimum weights for your linear regression model. Right? Now, OK, so x transpose x, the whole thing inverted x transpose. This is called the pseudo inverse of matrix x because matrix x may not be square, right? It could be, it's actually usually is not a square matrix, right? Because m and n plus 1 
uh, n may not be equal. Actually, they are not in most cases. But if you multiply this by x, you get the identity matrix. So it's called the pseudo matrix. In MATLAB, you can actually directly calculate it. X dx may be singular if you have redundant features. So redundant feature, for example, if you have the house price in dollars and cents, if you have the house area in square meters and square feet, you can get a singular matrix here that it cannot be inverted. Or if you have more features than variables, again, you cannot invert that matrix, right? You do not have, it's like trying to fit, um, let's say, two data points to a third order polynomial. You don't have enough variables to figure out all those coefficients. And uh, okay, so to calculate this weight vector, you need to invert an n plus one by n plus one matrix. It's actually not a big deal. In sensing applications, n is 10, n is 15, n is 20. And even a cheap microcontroller can do that in a fraction of a second. If you have a computer, it's okay up to maybe 10,000, 100,000 or so elements, right? You have plenty of memory nowadays, plenty of computation power. But if you go and look at you know, some of the problems that <coughs> these people on Facebook or, or Twitter or Google are trying to do, their number of features is much, much, much larger. So you cannot really go and invert that matrix anymore. And what they do is that they go and try to um, numerically minimize that function. So try to minimize this numerically. And we talk about that very, very quickly, uh, briefly. So here is one example of linear regression. Let's assume that this is the output of a sensor that if X changes from 0 to 10, Y changes from zero, 3 to 5. I don't know, a single supply sensor interface, for example, can produce that. And this is the measured data that we have from that sensor. And you feed the data and you get something that looks more or less uh, like the original data. Moving on, um, as I mentioned, you can actually come up with new features, and this is actually very common, uh, to, and still use linear regression, right? So for example, if you're measuring the power of the signal, but you're interested in, uh, let's say, V as well as the power, you can have V and V squared. Or if you're interested in area as well as length, you can actually correlate those or produce new um, features here, right? For example, if you're, let's say go back to that house price. If the length of the house and depth of the house, let's say, from the street side are two features, you can come up with a new feature that is length times width, which probably is a better indicator. It's the area of the house. It's probably a better indicator of the, uh, the value of the house than either the length or the depth. So you can come up with all these new features in your model, and this is still a linear regression model because it is linear in Ws. So you can actually solve nonlinear problems. Uh, one way to quantify how well your algorithm does is to calculate the coefficient of determination. Basically, you normalize the changes, the, the errors that you have in your model by the variance of your output. And you want this to be as close as possible to 1. So if it is close to 1, it means that your algorithm is feeding well or your function is feeding well to the data. If it is not, there is some issue. One of the issues could be that your model is not complex enough, right? So for something like this, maybe I want to use a third order polynomial. Maybe I want to add an x1 and then x1 cubed term here in order to uh, take into account that nonlinearity. OK. Um, this is data set size. This is the effect of that bias in, uh, that we mentioned. 
So just moving on. Um, if this is my true function, I, if I don't use enough training data, I can actually come up with the wrong function. And if you look at the training error versus test error, so training error is the number of data points that I choose here, so three, and then I'm trying to fit to all of that. You can see that as I increase the number of training elements, my errors go down, but the training error will keep going down as I increase the uh, M, uh, sorry, both of them can plateau after a while. So what I want to do is probably, you know, after this many points, I don't really need more data. This is plateauing. What is more important is model complexity here. If the data comes from a function like this, this is a quadratic function, and if I don't choose the right order for my function, so let's say if I choose a line, you can get a good amount of training and test error here. Increase the order to two, I, both of those errors will drop. Three, I will fit my data. As I increase the number of data points more and more, I will fit my data better. But at some point, I'm going to start to overfit my training data. And then I, I fit these perfectly. Let's say with 10 data points, I'm going to fit these perfectly. Or if I increase it, I will fit uh, with the order of polynomial 15. I'm going to fit these data points perfectly. But it will do very, very poorly on. Um, new data points. Um, so the order that you choose, the model complexity is important, and then the way to do it, the way to, if you don't know anything about your problem, and you want to just choose the uh, degree of uh, freedom for your polynomial, you have to go through something like that, right? So you go and take some data points, you try to figure out what is the, how is the performance of your algorithm on training data versus new data, and you try to choose somewhere around here. Like in this case, let's say four, five seem to be a good enough uh, order for this polynomial. In fact, you know, if, if I knew this, I would have chosen two. But based on this, looks like anywhere close three, four, five is good enough, and I will get um, not too much error on new test data. Gradient descent for a quick overview. We are not going to use this in most cases in most sensing applications because, as I said, if you want to find the weights, it's just in reading a matrix that is not too big for sensing. But in uh, cases that you have to numerically minimize that function, what you do is that you go and figure out the slope of that function, the cost function at any given point, and you move in the opposite direction. You move towards the minimum of that function. Um, so your new weights are chosen from the slope of that function at that location. Whatever you had at that location, right? That's your starting point. The slope of that uh, J function at that location. And you go and replace this W as you try to move towards the minimum of that function slowly over time. This alpha is a parameter that you choose. It's called the learning rate. You don't want to choose a very small alpha because that means that you take very, very small steps toward this minimum, but you also don't want to pick a very large one because you can just jump over this minimum to the other side and you can go back and forth or actually even diverge instead of converging to it. So just picking this alpha can take a while, a little bit of experimentation, well, trial and error to figure it out. And one issue with uh, gradient descent is that you can end up at different local minimas depending on your starting point, right? Um, so if you start from this point here, let's say if this is your starting point for weights, you can end up in this minima. If you start here, you can actually end up in this minima. And one of the uh, things that people think about or thought about when they were developing these algorithms for machine learning is that they want to come up with functions for J for error functions that are convex, that have one minimum. So that if you approach to that, it's the global minimum. So just trying to come up with a J that is convex, that is a convex minimization problem, that is, a, that is not straightforward. But fortunately for most of these algorithms, um, somebody has already done the hard work. Uh, debugging learning algorithms, so you know, keeping that linear regression in mind, 
if you get more training examples, you can have, uh, you can fix your high variance issues, right? High variance is, means that your model is overfitting your training data. So if you have more data, you can try your model on new data or new cross-validated data and then figure it out, figure out a better model. Uh, if you have a t model that is too complex, usually you want to get rid of some features that you don't need. And then again, the formal method is principal component analysis. You try to keep features that create the largest variation at the output, and it also gets rid of the high variance issues. Sometimes you don't have enough features, and you want to either measure new features or generate new features. So for example, generating new features could be multiplying the length and width of that area that house to, to get the area. Sometimes you want to measure more features. So actually, I just saw a paper fairly recently that these people were trying to monitor the movement of a hand. And they just added a temperature sensor, and all of a sudden, they they measured their um, accuracy improved. It's hard to justify it, but it's an added feature that it helped. I, I wouldn't recommend doing that. You know, if you don't know how this is affecting your output, how it is improving the output, chances are that it will not work in, in some other cases. But uh, additional features usually fix the bias problem if your model is not fitting well to the uh, training or test data. Adding polynomial features like higher orders of the variables or cross products can actually, again, produce new features, so it adds complexity to your model. And regularization can actually fix both of these problems, underfitting or overfitting. But we use that when you have a whole bunch of new features. Okay, so linear regression, everybody knows, everybody understands. Now let's move on to a classification problem. Linear regression is continuous. You get a number for your input variables. Uh, but in classification, you get a class label, right? So here's one example. I have blue and red dots or square and, and uh, circular dots. They come from two different classes, right? So I have features X1 and X2 that looks like they actually create a, uh, if I, let's say, plot them like this, they produce a separable uh, feature. I have a separable um, problem here. I can easily separate the two if I just put a boundary between, let's say, these two classes here. So in a classification problem, in a binary classification problem, your output is one if X belongs to the class. So for example, the in, a, in this classification problem, let's say if I'm considering uh, these uh, blue dots, um, Y is one for these guys if they belong to that class, so that's for, for this one it's going to be zero, for example, right? And Y zero means that X doesn't belong to that class. So this is binary classification, very simple. Already, the problem is that you want to come up with a function that predicts whether the input belongs to this class or this class, whether the input output is, let's say, one for blue, zero for red, depending on values of x1 and x2. So we want to come up with that function. That's the classification problem. And just looking at the way that we are doing it, the output is either 0 or 1 for a whole bunch of values for x1 and x2. It's already a nonlinear problem. Right? So nonlinear problems are usually harder to solve. And the goal is to come up with a boundary here. And then how you come up with the boundary here and then how well that boundary separates the two from each other will depend on the algorithm and training that you do. So for the very first algorithm that I want to talk about here, it's K nearest neighbors. It's very, very intuitive. So one of the instance-based learning, this is essentially, they're called lazy learning because you're really not doing learning. You look at the data and you just try to follow whatever the data tells you. You do not try to come up with a function here. You just say, the data is my model, right? So for example, in here you say, I don't want to come up with a function. I'll try to find a way that if uh, a new data point is closer to these guys, I, belong, I make it, uh, I assign it to this class. If it is closer to these guys, I assign it to this class. It's as simple as that, right? So there's no 
function, really. So for that reason, they're called actually lazy learning. Uh, the, as I said, I want to see if it is closer to that class or the other class. It is a problem of figuring out how similar is this new data point to the existing data, to the labeled data that you already have. Um, there is usually no training involved, and KNN is one of them. What we do is that we assign a new data point to a certain class depending on the proximity of this new data point to the members of that class. Right? I'll show you an example very soon. But what I do is that I, if I get a new, let's see, um, okay. So for example, if I go here and let's say X1 is if, let's say I want to identify the animal based on whether they have, uh, actually this is not good because there is more than that. Let's say I want to identify a digit between let's say zero and um, some other number, let's say six, right? And one of them is the portion of the pixels that are, one of these X1 and X2, one of them is the portion of the pixels that are black with respect to the entire uh, um, total data set. And X2 is, let's say, the symmetry. You know, how many of them are above this line compared to how many are below that line? And then, you know, depending on where these two parameters fall, I can separate the two, let's say, zero and six from each other, right? Um, so the question here is that, where are we here? The question here is that how do I define that similarity? And um, n-dimensional space is the number of features that you have in your data set. K is the number of neighbors considered, right? So I, I, when I have this new data point, I can say, okay, I look at what is the closest data point to this one, and I assign it to that class. So that case is K equal one. Or what I can say is that let me find the three closest members to this data point, and I see which class they belong to, and I assign this to the class with the highest vote or, or some other um, assignment uh, uh, technique. I'll show you some figures here quickly. You, I, hopefully this will become a bit more close, a bit more clear. Let's see, this is an example of animal pictures. And I have labeled these. I know that these are cats. This is a buffalo. This is another cat. This is another cat, another buffalo, so on and so forth, right? And when I say that I have labeled these is that I have extracted features based on this data set. So for example, one feature could be, you know, are the ears pointy and upwards or not, right? Uh, is the face round or not? Do I have horns? or not, right? This could be all features that I extract from these images. And based on that, I have put cats at one corner of this feature space, buffaloes at another corner, and what else do I have? And maybe elephants it in another corner. And now the question is that, here's a new picture. Where do I put this? What kind of an animal is this? So the first thing I do is that I go and extract features for this new animal. You know, are the ears pointy? Is the face round? Does it have horns, all of that? And it puts it somewhere in that feature space. And then I try to measure the distance between this point, this new data point in feature space and the closest uh, samples. So for example, it goes and falls in this portion of the space. I see that, okay, this is the, these are the three closest elements, these are the three closest uh, samples in that feature space to this new sample. And these three, all three of them are cats. So therefore, this must be a cat. If for whatever reason, it happens to fall in this portion of the space, I go and look at the closest um, samples in that space, I see two of them are cats, and one is a buffalo. And I can have a voting system here. So. If, if, I ha if I take three votes and two of them are cats and one buffalo, I still say this is a cat, right? And that's the algorithm. This is basically really as simple as 
it is. Uh, what you need is to measure the distance of your new sample in that feature space to all other samples, figure out what are the closest samples to this, and assign it to the class with the highest number of votes. Very, very simple to understand and implement. So for example, here is a feature space. I have three labels for this feature space, two dimensional, let's say X1 and X2 are my two features, and I have three classes here. And the distance that you use, you can use different functions to calculate the distance between this new sample and all the, feature, uh, all the training samples. Euclidean distance is the most common one. You basically go and subtract the elements of the feature vectors from each other and calculate the, some of the squared differences. This is Euclidean difference. It works well in many cases, but there are many, many, many other functions that you can use to calculate the distance between a new sample and, and existing um, uh, samples in the feature space. So let's say if this is your new sample, you go and calculate this function between this and all of these samples in the memory in your feature space. Pick the three closest. So the three closest will be these three here, and you take a vote. And because these three belong to triangles here, you say, OK, this should belong to this class. Very easy. You can improve, or let's say reduce the noise in your, your measurements by increasing the number of, uh, by increasing k. You can say, I can look at one sample, or three samples, or five samples, or, or so many samples. Usually an odd number. You don't want to have ties. But let's say you have three samples here, then you can have actually seven, k of seven. Still, it belongs to that class over there. You can have a little bit trickier situations. Uh, so for example, k of 1, if my new sample is here, is going to assign it to this class. This new sample is going to be assigned to this class. But if I choose a k of 5, for example, that same sample is going to be assigned to this star class. Right? Because now if I just count the number of samples near samples to this c, to this uh, x, Three of them are from the star class, two are from the square class, so therefore I should assign it to that star class. So depending on the number of samples that I want to count, it may be assigned to different classes. And part of it is manual. You know, you have to look at your performance, you have to look at the performance of the algorithm and try to decide, you know, is the function that I'm using to measure that distance doing a good job or not, right? So or you can assign more weight to samples that are closer to your new data point. So for example, if um, one of the ways to assign weight is to go and say 1 over the square distance is going to be uh, the vote for this sample. And basically, if there's a sample, if three samples that are really far from your sample, they may have less effect than these two samples that are nearby closer by, right? So you, you go and adjust that, and there's some manual intervention that you have to do sometimes. Or you can go and change the function that you use to measure the distance. So instead of using the Euclidean distance, you can, for example, use the exponential. So you can measure e to the power of x1 minus x2 squared, for example, exponential. So it drops much, much more quickly. Automatically, it gives more weight to the uh, samples that are close to your new sample. No, 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 because you don't know. You're just assuming that it, it belongs to this class, but you don't know. It may not. Yeah. So in future, you don't use that as part of your training. Okay. Yeah, you just do it, and you move on. Yeah, so you're basically polluting your data. Yeah. OK, so a couple of problems here. Um, in your system, in your model, different features can have different importances and different scales. So for example, if I'm interested in figuring out whether I'm going to have a heart attack in three days from now, you can look at some parameters that you know, quantify my current stat, uh, situation. You can look at my height, my weight, gender, cholesterol level, and there's databases out there that 
tell you some relationship between these and you know having a heart attack in in uh, within a, you know with certain limit but if you look at these parameters they are on vastly different scales my height if measured in centimeters is you know some number between 100 and 200 my weight is some number in kilograms it is between let's say i don't know 10 and 100 or 10 and 150 or something like that right uh, but if I change the unit to, let's say, grams, it's all of a sudden a thousand times larger. Right? And uh, gender, you know, you can have, I don't know, two, three choices here. Cholesterol level, again, is a relatively finite uh, ranges of uh, values here. And then the units are defining all of these parameters. I can measure this age in years, in months, in days. Right? And what happens is that once you have these different parameters with different scales, when you're adding these distances, the ones that have higher scales, the ones that are you know, larger, are going to dominate. In this problem, this is probably the most important parameter. But the values are milligrams per milliliters. Let's say the range is between 50 and 100. But if I measure my height in centimeters, that number is already 200, right? If I measure my weight in grams, that's in thousands. That distance almost, uh, almost, it will not have any dependence on this when I measure it between different people that are in that database, right? So this is going to be a problem. This is going to throw off your measurement, your classification. And uh, yeah, so we just mentioned that. Same thing. So what we do is that to avoid that problem, we transform the features with their Z scores, right? So you basically normalize them. You take the average of the features and you divide that difference uh, between what feature is and the average by the standard deviation. This is very common and you basically can get any real number here, but most likely most numbers are going to be between minus three and three. Uh, another way to normalize features is that you divide um, this uh, number by the range of variables. Right? So for that particular variable, you divide it by the range. So you subtract the minimum from your variable and you divide it by the range. And in that case, all of the features are going to fall between zero and one. And everybody is now treated equally in that algorithm. If you want to do that or not, sometimes maybe not. There is um, another issue with KNN is, is that if you have irrelevant issues, irrelevant features, they may throw off your algorithm again. You know, if you have features that shouldn't affect the output, but there is numbers for them in your feature vector, they can throw off your algorithm quite a bit as, as well. And this is called curse of dimensionality. It is, again, an overfitting uh, problem. And what, for example, an example here is that if you want to determine whether the, some food item is healthy or not, the price probably is not a good feature to include in your data, in your feature vector, right? It doesn't tell you much about the healthiness. Maybe it does, but in most cases, it may just throw off your uh, algorithm, right? Uh, nearest neighbor algorithm can be thrown off by these irrelevant features relatively easily. That's actually a, a problem. And uh, it usually requires a little bit of manual intervention on your side. You have to go, and especially in sensing applications, it's not too hard. You, know, you, you have a limited number of features, so you can sort of say what are the relevant features to the output. The other thing that you can do more formally is that eliminate feature and see the performance of the new algorithm, eliminate this one and see the performance of the algorithm, and evaluate over many different algorithms, and choose the one <coughs> that gives you the least error. And if possible, sometimes you can use methods like principal component analysis to maintain the highest amount of variance at the output using a, a subset of the features. So KNN is one of my favorite algorithms, and the reason is that you can understand how it works. You can easily figure out how it works. If it is working well or not, you usually see that right away. And it is very powerful. It actually works as well as a lot of fancier algorithms and simple problems. 
Um, <coughs> there's no training, but you just take the data and you start using it. Um, this is a problem. Because there is no training, you know, when you have a new data point, you have to measure the distance of this new data point with all of the other samples in the feature space. So you need to keep all of them in the memory. And you need to do the com computation. And each time you have a new sample, you have to repeat all of those calculations. Usually, if you have more data, that's true about most <coughs> statistical learning problems, uh, algorithms anyway. Your accuracy improves with data. <coughs> It's a one-round feature, one-round algorithm, and up to 20 features, you know, as long as the problem is understandable and your, your brain can follow it, it is actually a very good uh, algorithm for classification. There's really no configuration needed, <coughs> very minimal. You want to choose how many neighbors you want to pick. K, the smaller the K, the smaller the number of neighbors that you pick, the noisier is your algorithm. By increasing K, you somewhat doing a little bit of low pass filtering, right? So if it is, if it, you just decide on class based on the nearest neighbor, the single nearest neighbor, you will have a lot of noise in the output. But if you say, okay, I want it to be close to three, five, seven, nine, uh, you can uh, improve the, noise, the performance, you can make it smoother. Um, MATLAB, for example, can actually automatically choose the optimal value for K for you. It goes and tries it on a bunch of different uh, k values, and <coughs> chooses the optimal value. How you weight the neighbors? Do you want to just number count the number of nearest neighbors, or do you want to assign a weight to, let's say, for example, distance they have to your sample? That is important. It is very, very common to. Uh, give a weight to the vote from each sample based on to the inverse of their square distance. That's actually a very common way to do that. Basically, you want to favor the near neighbors. <coughs> and uh, what are the features? Again, that feature uh, extraction, selection is probably the most important thing you can do in all of these uh, statistical learning algorithms. <coughs> Cons, it is subject to a good bit of error if you have irrelevant attributes, irrelevant features, and it requires a lot of memory and computation compared to a lot of these other classification methods that we'll see. You, the, and part of that is there's really no training, right? You just look at all of the data and each new data point has to do the calculation, repeat the calculation for all of the data set. <coughs> now, Going to the next level, another algorithm that behaves in a way that is relatively easy for people to understand, to follow, is uh, decision trees. So in a decision tree, you try to divide the data set into two groups, and you just do it sequentially. <clears throat> you go and find the biggest divide between these two that can separate it into two separate groups. So let's say belonging to class blue versus not. And then among that, you try to go and separate it between, let's say, two other groups that belong to, let's say, group red and group uh, green, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> it is a tree-like structure. So for example, what you can do is that at the very first stage, you can say that if these are my two features, I can come up with this border for x1, based on the value for x1, that divides this into something on the right side that belongs to one class and something that doesn't. And this is giving me the best division between these two classes. <clears throat> and then you, in terms of how it looks like, you know, if algorithm, uh, it, let's say on a graph-like structure, you can say, okay, I look at value for x1. If it is larger than x1, I go down this path. If it is smaller than x1, I go down this path, right? So now I'm gonna divide it between two classes, classes two and three. So two is the, the green one, three is the blue one. This 
border divides these two classes best for me at this stage. Once you go down that path, you can go here and you say, okay, so for the ones that are here, for the ones that are assigned to class two, let me see if I can come up with a new value for, let's say, X2 that does the best job in dividing things between classes two and three, for example. And you come up with that value. So that's the training part, right? So that's usually an optimization part that your whatever software you use can take care of. And then you keep doing this. You keep going down that path and you try to divide this space into smaller and smaller regions so that you get <coughs> a more and more accurate prediction for your uh, assigned classes. And you can just keep doing it until you classify every single point in your training data correctly. However, that will be a uh, model that is too complex. That will be a model that is probably not going to generalize the new data very well. And at some point, you really don't want to go that far. So maybe I let go of that single point that was here. And what you do is that you maybe <clears throat> build this tree and go and get rid of some of the ones that are just too fine at the bottom. They call it pruning the tree. You go and rid of some of these uh, divisions at the bottom, and you look at the variance at the output, and you see if the classification error is uh, getting much worse by pruning. The other thing that they usually do is that <coughs> they usually go and, especially if you can divide this training set into multiple training and validation sets, you can go and train different trees based on different input data, and you pull the outputs of all those trees, right? So you create, let's say, you take your data set, divide it into three subsets, no, not like that, but divide it into three top subsets, you train on these two, validate on the third, then you train maybe on the last one, the first one and the third one, validate on the second, and then maybe you train on the second and third and validate on one. You have three different trees. And then you go and look at, <clears throat> you maybe pull the output of those trees. So you have a new data point, you fit it to tree one, tree two, tree three, and you maybe take a vote between all of those. So that's called a random forest. But um, trees are easy to understand because it's logical, right? You just larger, smaller, larger, smaller, and you can actually visualize it relatively easily. However, and for that reason, they're actually very popular, at least for demonstration purposes. So sometimes you go and try to come up with a model for your tree. This is actually one of those cases that you can use or one of those algorithms that you can use to come up with good features for your algorithm. You create trees and you see if the feature that you have defined, if the feature that you've come up with is helping you in dividing this uh, data into different classes. <coughs> um, they can handle numerical and categorical data, so if it is zero, one, or continuous numbers, they can handle that. And you really don't need a lot of data to create a tree, right? You can start just have one binary uh, selection. If you have a lot of data, however, you can actually get very complex trees. The other problem is that they are relatively unstable. You know, small variations in your training data can create really different um, trees from each other. And for that reason, you need to create forests, basically create many, many trees and pull the output from them. But the other issue is that if one feature, trees, uh, one feature dominates, the tree can be biased. And normalization can help. Trees are good for visualization, not so good in practice. So I use trees all the time to show the output, how this thing is working, but it, it, I do not really start with trees. I usually end with trees. Or, or if I'm f trying to select features, I use trees during those regions, those times, because I can understand how this thing works. It can, it's easy to visualize, it's really easy to follow that tree. Uh, those branches and see if the algorithm is doing a good job or not. But in the end, I probably go and use a different algorithm to implement. Um, with KNN, you can actually stick with KNN all the way. But trees tend to be a bit trickier. Um, okay, so let me see. We have about 20 more slides. Okay. <coughs> now, we talked about regression. And we called it linear regression because it was linear in weights. And there is 
another problem that <coughs> uh, I want to do a classification and it's a regression I, I, I'm gonna call it logistic regression because instead of assigning a label 0 1 to the class I want to attach a probability to it I'd say with 90% probability it belongs to class 1 but there is a 8% probability that it can belong to class 2 and so on and so forth right so this is called logistic regression it's somewhat related to linear regression but not exactly if you want to use linear regression that's what you get right so you fit a line to that data obviously it doesn't classify for us right what I want is a line like this that separates these two classes for me and the question is that how do I come up with the equation for this line for that line it was easy I just looked at the weights and you know one line of code could actually give me all the weights for this one <coughs> it's a bit trickier how do I come up with the equation uh, for this line that separates these two classes and if I have that equation it's not too difficult to classify a new problem a new data point right so if I have this the equation for this line all the points on this line will give me a zero if it is a positive number it's above this line if it is a negative number it's you know when when I put the new data point into that equation for the line a positive data point means that it is above this line so it belongs to this class a negative output means it's below this line so it belongs to this class so all I need to do is to figure out the equation for that line okay so <clears throat> as I said for classification problems I I prefer a probability that says you know this because if I get zero and one sometimes it makes my life a bit harder right I cannot trust any of these algorithms that much anyway this is just a function that I'm developing so if I ask it you know is this a picture of a cat or not if it says yes well, that's not too bad, right? It actually probably is good. But if it tells me that, you know, I think it is 65% chance. I give it a 65% chance that it is a cat. But there is 35% chance that it may not be. In most cases, I prefer that probabilistic uh, answer better. I, I have, a, you know, maybe what am I, anything that I'm going to do afterwards with that decision, if the confidence is not that high in the output of that algorithm, maybe I do things a bit differently. I like to have that probability instead of a yes, no answer. The other thing is that sometimes <clears throat> I'm trying to determine if this belongs to, let's say, five classes. There are five classes and I have a new data point and I want to see which class best uh, or which uh, this data point should be assigned to each one of those classes. So I can say, you know, 25% to this class, 20% to this class, 2% to that one. 50% to this one and so on and so forth. And I assign it to the class with the highest probability. If I just have a bunch of zeros and ones, I cannot do that very easily. So I often prefer a probability or, or, or a degree of confidence in the output for my classification than just a zero one. Uh, so what I can do is that I can come up with a threshold, for example. Right? So I say, if the probability is more than 50%, I assign it to this class. If it is less, I assign it to the rest, to the other class. And my goal is to come up with the proper function here that I can minimize properly later. Right? So I'm going back to all those uh, basic definitions we had for machine learning. <coughs> it turns out that there's a whole bunch of functions that can actually map the entire range of um, real data to 0, 1, interval which is the range of your probabilities and one of them is the sigmoid function so this sigmoid function <clears throat> takes any real data any real value here z and maps it to the interval of zero and one right so if z is zero you get one over two it's half for a very large positive z this goes to zero and you get one and for a very large negative z, it becomes the entire uh, fraction approaches zero. So this, <clears throat> it's not that it is giving me the probability, but it is mapping all of those uh, real numbers from minus infinity to, to infinity. 
to the zero one interval. It makes my life a bit easier. I can treat it like a probability, but it's not probability. So, and then there are other functions that people have used, but this is the most common function to come up with a notion of confidence. Excuse me, isn't that similar to neural network? It is. A logistic regression is at the heart of a neural network. So we'll get to that soon. <clears throat> right? Now, logistic regression is this. So basically, what I do is that I go and say, this is my feature vector. These are my weights. This is my logistic regression function. The output of this, based on the weights that I choose, is a number between 0 and 1. If it is above 50%, let's say, sometimes you can move that threshold, but if it is above 50%, I say this, is, this output belongs to this class. If it is less, it belongs to that class. My goal here is to go and figure out what these Ws are. Right? Using training data and a proper cost function, this is the cost function that I choose, and it is a convex cost function. So using training data, <coughs> I go and choose the right values for W, so that uh, for any feature vector that, for any new um, sample that you give me, I've set the weights using my training data and I give you a number that is not a probability but you can treat it as a probability, right? It's a number between zero and one that gives me, uh, should give you some confidence on whether this belongs to class zero or class one, okay? And <clears throat> that is it. And then this uh, um, cost function, if you look at it, yk, if it is 0, this first term is 0, and this second term, you just calculate this, and you take the log of this, and you try to minimize that. It's actually become a relatively straightforward uh, numerical simulation, sorry, uh, minimization problem because of the definition of the loss function this way. So you go and minimize this function and you figure out WIs. And from that point onward, you can classify. Very nice and easy. In MATLAB, if you have to do it numerically, you can use fmin search or fmin on constraint to figure out the uh, minimum that satisfies this cost function. Now, the problem is that a logistic regression uh, classifier is binary, but in many cases you have actually more than two classes. So you have three classes or so. And in these ca uh, cases, what you do is that you take one versus the rest approach. So for example, what you do is that you go and say, okay, I look at this class, and the first thing I do is that I go and come up with this logistic regression function that classifies the um, what is it? The red triangles for me. So it tells me if it is a red triangle or not. And then I come up with a second regression function, the logistic regression function, that tells me if it is a blue square or not, and a third one. I come up with these three functions, and then if you give me a new data point, I put it here, 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 and I take the class with the highest probability. So if this tells me for the new data point, this tells me 20, this tells me 35, this tells me 15, I take this one, right? So you can expand logistic regression to higher dimensions, to higher, <coughs> to classifying higher, uh, a larger number of classes. Pros, uh, it has low variance. It provides probabilities for outcomes. This is actually very nice and handy, and we're gonna see that in neural networks in a second. You don't assume anything for the distribution of the variables. You just get the data and uh, you fit your logistic regression to that data. You, can't, you don't really have too many uh, parameters to play with here, so you can actually be trapped in the high bias situation. And uh, if the inputs are categorical, if it is zero and one, it may not work that well. It actually prefers the input features to be numerical. Nonetheless, it's one of, again, my favorite algorithms because it's very easy to understand. It's not too hard to figure out how a logistic regression function works. But it is important for another reason, and as you mentioned, it is at the core of neural networks. In a neural network, we'll see that in a second, you actually have a whole bunch of these guys working in parallel. 
Okay, so another classifier that I like a lot again is naive base. This is again very easy to understand. You can figure out how this thing is working. And it's not, it actually works quite well in a lot of sensing applications anyway. So what happens here is that in naive Bayes, <clears throat> you have some labeled data, so let's say blue and green and yellow. And what you go and uh, assume is that you assume this comes from one probability distribution. So there is a Gaussian distribution with a certain mean and a certain variance that produces this data set based on these feature vectors x1 and x2. And there is another distribution that produces this, and then another distribution that produces this. So you come up with three distributions, three mu's and three sigma's, let's say, in one dimension. In 2Ds, you have vectors, right? uh, matrices. But let's say if you just focus on one dimension, for example, forget about this x2. Let's say if you just had one x, I come up with three distributions. This distribution one that has this mean, this distribution two that has this mean, and its own variance, and then the third one. And now if you give me a new data point, I, I actually go and figure out what these distributions are based on these labeled data. New data point, if it is here, I go and calculate the probability using this distribution, and the probability of something from this class to be here, and the probability of something from this class to be here. And I assign the new data point to the class that gives me the highest probability. Again, it's very easy to understand. Right? So you just figure out what those distributions are. New data point gives you, those distributions give you the probabilities. Uh, very easy to understand, and I actually like it because you can follow the <coughs> process. Uh, you usually assume Gaussian distribution independent for all the features that you have. And uh, even if the features are not independent, if there's some weak correlation between them, it still works relatively well. It is fast. You know, all you need to do is to figure out what is a Gaussian distribution based on a bunch of numbers. You can very quickly fit. So the mean of that Gaussian distribution is the mean of your data points. Very quickly you can figure that out, right? Um, it works with high dimensions. You know, it's just such a simple algorithm that can work with many, many, many features. Noisy data is okay because noise was Gaussian as well, and you know you can actually it can handle a little bit of noise in the data. Um, this part can be a shortcoming that feature independence may not be um, valid. The assumption of feature independence may not be valid. So <clears throat> there is a derivative approach called discriminant analysis, which is very similar to naive Bayes, but this doesn't assume independence between the variables, right? So you basically take into account the correlations between the features, and it works better in some cases than naive Bayes, especially if you have um, uh, correlations between your features. I still prefer naive Bayes to linear discriminant analysis. Okay, so getting close to the fancier algorithms. Support vector machines, if you look at the performance of them, they're probably among the best performing algorithms out there for classification. What they do is that they go and find the optimum boundary between classes for you. And the definition of optimum boundary, so if you look at that data, all of those are going to all of those lines are going to separate the two classes for you, right? All of them will separate the two classes for you. SVM will pick the best one, and the the, the question is that how do you define best? In an SVM, the definition of the best is that it chooses the boundary that has the maximum distance between both classes. It just goes right through the middle of them, right? <coughs> Obviously, this can become nonlinear very quickly. And then the question of how you measure the distance is another important factor. So again, you can measure the distance based on Euclidean distance, you know, the distance from here to this line, you can measure Euclidean distance. Or there is more common, that, that is called a kernel, let me just see. The distance function here in SVM is called a kernel. So I can have a Euclidean kernel, 
that measures the distance, you know, that straight line, the length of that straight line. You can have exponential kernels that looks at this distance and divides it by some number and takes the exponent of it and a whole bunch of other kernels that you can use in SVMs. <coughs> SVM with nonlinear kernels can be used, and they can actually separate nonlinearly uh, the problems that are not linearly separable. You can actually come up with boundaries, nonlinear boundaries between those classes. It's a binary classifier by default in its fundamental situation, but you can have multi class SVM based on that one versus all approach. Again, the same thing that we did for logistic regression. Does it belong to this class versus the rest? You can do the same thing with SVM uh, for classification. SVMs are, so I'm not gonna say they're better than neural networks, but they're trusted more than neural networks in terms of classification. When you have a classification problem, usually SVMs are trusted more. It's usually the go-to algorithm at the end. Once you have decided that you want to use machine learning and you want to do the classification and all do that, you may start with KNN or Naive Bayes or some other algorithm that is easier to understand to figure out what features you want to keep and you know what are the redundant features or what are the features that you need to add. But in the end, you probably go and implement it in an SVM, in a support vector machine. The reason that you do not start with an SVM is that it's not easy to troubleshoot them. If they go wrong, if they misclassify data points, it's not easy to figure out why that happened. But what you do is that you go and choose your features, you normalize your features, you figure out what are the ones that you want to keep and you don't want to keep, or, or what are the new ones that you want to generate. And let's say you do all of that with a naive base or a KNN, and then you go and use a, an SVM at the end. And usually SVM does a better job than whatever you picked at the beginning anyway. Um, so they usually have the best accuracy among all these algorithms that we mentioned so far. Yes? Uh, they're not NBOs connected to these cores? No, 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 to this thing. There's no overlap anywhere on them. Yeah, that's going to add to your error. So if you, <coughs> you can actually, so you can pull let's say if you have two classes and then one point from this class happens to be here, you can either ignore it and accept some classification error in your training, or you can go and try to come up with an SVM that actually separates that one as well. And that may give you an overfitting problem. Right? So you may have a variance problem, I'm sorry, a variance problem in that case. But we can, like trees, you can just make them as fine-grained as you want. You can just go and separate every data point in this thing perfectly in your training set. It may not work well for you either. So it depends on how much you want to accept in terms of error, classification error, on your training set. Right? So it's, it's, and uh, yeah, so they, I, I think the pro or the main pro is that they are Usually the most accurate ones at the end of the story if you choose the parameters right, like the distance function and all that. And this is the biggest problem with them, that they're hard to interpret. We really cannot figure out how this thing is doing its uh, job. And because you have, the performance depends so much on the type of kernel you choose, well, and you have so many different options for kernels, choosing the right kernel is not straightforward either. Okay, so. We have a little bit of time left, <coughs> about half an hour. And neural networks, so these are the famous ones, right? So I think besides linear regression, everybody has heard about neural networks more than anything else. Um, what we are trying to do with the neural network is that we would like to do some simple calculations on input data and classify the uh, input data into separate classes. Usually it's a classifier by its uh, nature. Um, we try to mimic what the brain does, right? So the brain takes input from a bunch of neurons and does, there's really not much computation power over there, but there's a lot of these computers that work in parallel. And the idea behind neural networks is the same thing, that you have these computers that don't do much, but you have a lot of them in parallel. They are very, very powerful and there is actually 
theoretical, um, or, or there are theorems that says a neural network can actually uh, replicate any function between certain limits, right? So they are basically, uh, I forgot the theorem, but anyway. Um, oh, universal approximation theorem, I have it right here. <laughs> so they basically can approximate any nonlinear function between a uh, one layer, basically. You just need one layer to do that. And <clears throat> this is the problem with neural networks, right? So like human brains, it's not easy to figure out how this neural network is doing its job. You can't start with a neural network, and they usually do a good job on your training set, and you can come up with some parameters to make them work well. But you can never be sure that they will work well on new data, and it's really hard to figure out what is going wrong if the data, if the algorithm misbehaves. So this is a typical structure for a neural network. You have your feature, network, feature um, vector at the input, a one plus a bunch of calculated or measured features. Each one of them is sent to a neuron with a weight. So W10 to W1N are weights assigned to uh, features from this neuron. This, uh, inputs to this neuron, and the neuron then takes all of those, calculates a function, an output, based on weighted sum of all these features. So you weight, use a weighted sum of all those features, pass it through a function, and create an output. That output goes to an output layer that, again, okay, I should have had another animation here takes the weighted sum of the outputs from a bunch of these neurons that are working in parallel and gives you a number. And that number, like logistic regression, is something between zero and one. It basically tells you how much confidence the uh, network has in this input being belonging to a class or not, right? Now, the issue here is that this H that we have here this can be different functions. People have used different functions. It can be a simple step function, simple threshold-based function, or, or ramp, or anything. But the co most common function people use here is that sigmoid function. So the sigmoid function that we used for logistic regression, they use the same function here. So in a neural network, each one of these neurons is actually a logistic regression uh, classifier. right? And then what they do is that as I said, with one hidden layer, with one layer between the input and output, there is this um, general approximation theorem that says you know it can approximate any function, but you can add more complexity. You can have another layer here, that the outputs of this first layer go into the bunch of other neurons there, and then they go to another bunch of other neurons, uh, and then at the end, they add up in one output layer. So then you can have multiple levels of neuron. That's the deep learning part. You know, when they talk about deep learning with neural networks, it's usually multiple layers, multiple hidden layers. For most of our applications, I never really needed more than one layer. Now, the problem with neural networks is that because these are a bunch of nonlinear functions, you know, the sigmoid function at the very least, and you're going through multiple of these in parallel, Oh, sorry, in series, right? So you have this sigmoid function here, sigmoid function here, sigmoid function here. All of that is added up, goes through another sigmoid function, and so on and so forth, or other functions. It's not easy to figure out what those weights should be. You have a whole bunch of those weights in this network, right? These thetas and these Ws. It's not easy to figure out what those weights should be. A lot of weights means that you need to have a lot of training data. So for a good neural network, for a properly working neural network so that it doesn't overfit the data, you need a lot of data. At the other, at, at the same time, there are really not set rules out there how to choose the number of these neurons in between, the input layer and output layer. So a rule of thumb that most people use is that they say it should be somewhere between the number of input layers and output layers, right? So if you have 10 input features and two outputs, the number of neurons here should be somewhere between two and 10. That's a wide range. And you can actually have hundreds of features here and only one output, right? So how do you choose? It's gonna be, let's say, between 100 and one. So what do you choose, two, three, four, five? 
So it's not really good. Uh, there is not a good way of figuring out how many neurons you want to put here. I don't want to even get started with how many layers you should have there. For sensing applications, my recommendation is that stick to one. You don't need more than one. Uh, but how to choose the number of neurons, uh, another recommendation that people have made is that you know basically two-thirds of your input features. So if you have 10 features, something around six, seven neurons should, should do the job, right? So that, and at least start from there. Another problem with neural networks is that they're, okay, so they're very hard to train because if you want to minimize that cost function, how do you do that? You have a whole bunch of these nonlinear equations or nonlinear functions that when you take the derivatives, it doesn't give you a linear system of equation at least, right? It gives you a nonlinear system of equation. And the big uh, breakthrough here was in, I think, uh, early 2000s, they found out this back propagation algorithm that you go and try to come up with values for these starting from the output going back to the input. It is back propagation. It's a numerical method to minimize the uh, cost function for the neural network, and that's what started all this deep learning, um, let's say, revolution or, or phenomena. Uh, oh, actually, one thing that is missing is that you always add that offset, right? So in here, you also have that one, this is one, and if you have multiple layers, that is one. Now, the problem with neural networks, the first problem is that you cannot figure out how they work. It's really hard to figure out how a neural network is processing your input. The second thing is that you can create neural networks. It's like a high degree polynomial that fit your data, that classify your training data perfectly, but they are very easily thrown off by small changes in input parameters. And I think many of you have, may have seen um, cases like this that I think uh, in one case, an image processing algorithm that was trained with neural networks, they showed a picture of a uh, turtle to it, and it said turtle. They changed a couple of pixels in that image, and it said it's a gun. It's a handgun. It just goes off very, very easily. And it's what, what I, ridiculously small number of pixels, maybe one or two pixels, that they changed in that picture, and it just said something totally different. They can overfit your training data very easily, and the problem is that you wouldn't be able to know it that easily. And there's so many things to change. Nonetheless, they are the buzzword of the day. They fit any function, and you know, if you want to talk about the statistical learning and machine learning, at least you have to know how they work. Maybe you don't use them that often, but you have to know how they work. Training is very complex, and these this is the feed-forward neural network. This is the simplest case. There's a whole bunch of other types of neural networks, the convolution type and the recurrent one and all those other ones. And each one of them becomes significantly more difficult uh, to train as you go on. Uh, picking the correct topology is difficult. You know, it's sort of an art, I would say. And lots of training data is needed because you have a lot of variables. But the problem is that you can overfit now. Uh, if they don't work well, it's not too easy to troubleshoot them. You know, it's hard to visualize how this thing is working. And then at the end of the story, you really don't know how this thing is doing its job. It's, it remains a black box. It does a good job, let's say, on training data and test data. All of that works relatively well. But at the end, you don't know how this is working. And for a lot of sensing applications, that's not good. Because if you don't know how this thing is working, you don't know how much trust you can put in it, right? So it's a summary of all these applications, these different uh, algorithms that we mentioned and how they work relative to each other. As I said, my favorite ones, the go-to ones are usually one of these first, these three. I try one of these three first. I usually go past decision trees very quickly. They are not really that good at classification. They, take time to train, and they're not really that much better than a Mary Bayes or KNN. KNN is very, very easy to implement. You know, if I see a pattern in the data, my KNN is already taken care of. Naive Bayes is good. Uh, neural networks are very, very powerful, but they're hard to train, and they are prone to overfitting. SVM is the one that you can go to if you want to be fancy. But practically, I would say Naive Bayes or KNN should do the job in most cases. Um, 
one more topic left it's about unsupervised learning i have put all of these slides on a dropbox folder that you can download uh, yeah, we may or may not have time to go through the machine learning in matlab matlab is the tool that i use but it's not the optimum tool obviously right so if you talk to statisticians they like to use r or python or something else but MATLAB is something that, as an engineer, I'm comfortable with. And yeah, it may not be very efficient, but it does the job, especially for sensing cases where I don't have too much data. Um, and in the end, I want to implement that algorithm on a microcontroller anyway. So I, you know, I don't want the fanciest thing. So uh, there is a set of slides for how to do these, uh, or at least some of these uh, algorithms, how to run them, or what are the commands for them in, in MATLAB. Uh, so let's just do this unsupervised learning part uh, as well. Um, when do I need this? If I, I don't have a target, right? So I just want to see if there's a pattern in this data. If I can come up with something that describes this data a little bit more concisely for me. And uh, for example, one of the applications could be image segmentation, right? So can I figure out? based on color, based on features, how, do, how can I do that to reduce this 16 megapixel, 20 megapixel image into something that is more compact, more um, easier to deal with. Uh, data compression is another application of um, unsupervised learning. So for example, if you have an image, you can go and figure out you know, how many colors I have in this image and are they closer to each other? And can I describe them in a, let's say, um, using boundaries, that this corner of the image is yellow and this corner is yellow, red and that corner is green. And instead of storing 20 megapixels times that many color bits, I can just store it in maybe 10 kilobytes. Um, sometimes we are trying to model a process that is producing the data, but we don't know enough the process about the process. So for example, if you're looking at an ancient language and you want to know how many characters were there, well, you don't know. You know, so maybe you can use a clustering algorithm, feed a lot of these uh, input that you have found, and you try to see if the machine can decide that you know they had 20 characters or 35, right? Something like that. Um, so the most common algorithm that people use is a k-means algorithm that is similar to KNN, k nearest neighbor. What we do is that you go and look at your data. So initially, all of that data is just one chunk. I don't have colors associated with it. There's just one chunk of data that I have. All of them are treated equally at the same. But I suspect that there are three classes of data here. I don't know. Maybe, but you know, if, if I'm a human and I'm looking at this, it says, oh, you know, these, these guys are probably one. This is another one. This is another one. So in this case, it's easy. But sometimes you just don't know. You just guess that there's this many groups here. And you go and start in this space. In this feature space, you say, OK, I put one. Uh, I assume this to be the center of one class, this to be the center for another class, and this to be the center for a different class. So these three locations in the uh, feature space. And then the next thing I do is that I go and classify all those samples that I have in feature space based on distances of those two decentroids. So they, I assign them to the closest centroid. So all these red dots are closer to this. So I assign them, or, or all these red dots are closest to this compared to the other two. So all of them are one class. Then this guy, all of these guys are assigned to one class. And yeah, these few data points over here are closer to this than this. So I separate the space into these classes based on these centroids. The next thing I do is that now I have three classes. I go and find the centroids for those actual classes. Now, I basically, the mean of all the features. So calculate the centroid for this class and move my centroid to that location. This is the new centroid. So all these three, after I did the initial classification, the centroid, the new centroid is here for class red, the new centroid is here for class yellow, and the new centroid is here for that class uh, cyan. And then I reclassify the entire feature space. 
So I assign all these points to the centroid that is closest to them. And I keep doing this. And over time, if you do it for long enough, you actually separate those in three distinct classes. Well, in this case, we started with three, and after a while, you ended up at, with a centroid that is at the center of this clump, and this one, and this one. And these are three distinct classes. Now, if you give me a new data point, I can assign it to one of these classes, or I can just tell you that, you know, it looks like that three is going to divide this set of information into three distinct classes, and that may be all you need for, uh, for your uh, algorithm. Now, a bunch of challenges exist. Uh, again, what, how do you define distance? How do you measure the distance between different samples and your centroids? Euclidean is, again, your, usually your starting point. Uh, initial set point, seed points, if you don't pick them right, it can take a very long time for the algorithm to go and find the centroids for those different clusters. So one way, one easy way to avoid that is to just pick three of the data points in your feature space. Don't start from a random location, just pick three of those data points, right? So you're not going to hopefully move too far away from those. Um, the issue is that, you know, depending on wh what your start point is, you can converge to different, or you can separate or, or cluster the data into different um, clusters, categories. So what you want to do is that you want to repeat this algorithm several times with different seeds and see if you get the same three clusters. If you do, then hopefully you have done it right. Problems that you will have or challenges, you know, how do you choose K? So in K nearest neighbor, I know that, you know, I choose the K that gives me, let's say, not so noisy output and does a good job in classification. But in here, I may be able to choose a K of one, two, three, all those numbers are possible. So what is the proper value for K? And there are formal ways of choosing K, but at the end of the story, it is something that you choose. It may or may not be the best value for, for the data. If you have noisy data and outliers, it can throw off your, your algorithm. You're not assuming any distribution here, right? So all these data points are treated equally. Um, if you have non-convex shapes, again, you may have a minimization problem. It's not easy to evaluate performance. You know, if you don't have targets, how do you evaluate performance? So this is becoming a bit of a challenge. So how do you evaluate performance? Um, but uh, for example, one of the ways to, that people decide whether this is a large or, or this is a proper way of clustering is that you look at the distance of the centroids to the elements that are assigned to that class. Um, and then, yeah, and then if you don't know the number of classes, this is again one of the ways to figure out what should that K be. You just minimize that function, minimize the distances to the centroids uh, by changing K. Uh, last point here, last, I think it's slide here, feature engineering. Uh, all of these, uh, you know, we mentioned all these different algorithms here and, and the, a little bit about the math behind them. At the end of the story, as I mentioned, for sensing data, choosing the feature is more important choose than choosing the algorithm. A lot of those algorithms will perform nearly the same as each other within a few percentage points, right? Uh, half a percent improvement or 0.1% improvement may be really, really important if you're looking at stock market or, or Twitter trends and things like that. Doesn't really mean much in sensing info cases because your errors can be larger than that, right? Or your noises can be larger than that. So how to choose features, and I, I would go and spend a lot of time here trying to figure out the proper feature for the task, transformations if I need to do anything. Normalization is usually a given. Uh, if I want to keep all the features or not and high order features, do I want to produce them or not? I spend a good amount of time here and then maybe half that much time or 30% that much time on which algorithm to choose. I just try a few different ones and I usually just try to stick to the one that I understand as much as I can. And uh, let me see. Yeah, let me just quickly, uh, any questions? 